thank you and welcome to the 2022 McKinnon Distinguished CEO Series. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to address some news that some of you may have heard or may not have heard. Uh, I, have an accept, I have accepted a position as the provost at the University of Utah. And so I will be joining them at the end of this year, start of next year. So I'm very sad to be leaving you all. I'm also excited about the career advancement opportunity. So thank you for all the well wishes. Um, and I'm extremely positive and excited about the really good hands that the Anderson School is in and the great trajectory we are on. And I anticipate looking forward to the great news that I continue to hear out of the school. So I'm excited about that, all of that. But importantly, this evening is about two amazing people that we have with us that we're celebrating tonight. We're going to get to enjoy a conversation between Peter Sanchez, CEO of Atrisco Companies, and Dr. Robert Del Campo. He's the executive director of Anderson's Corporate and Community Engagement Office. And then following that conversation, I'm really excited that we're going to be honoring and inducting Superintendent of Albuquerque Public Schools, Scott Elder, into the Anderson Hall of Fame. So I'm very excited about that. In tonight's audience, I'm really happy to see we've got a wide range of folks with us tonight. We have Anderson students here with us, EMBA students. We've got alumni, particularly from our MBA ed program that I'm really proud are here representing. Thank you. We've got members of the business community, advisory board members, staff and faculty and leaders. And so I thank you all for being here. And I want to recognize a few UNM leaders in particular. Uh, so I think I saw Riley White. Riley, are you here? Riley White is here, Prof Associate Professor of Finance and Associate Dean of Teaching and Learning. I believe Raj Mato is here. Raj is here. He is professor and also a, a chair of the Finance Innovation Department and interim chair of Accounting Department. I saw Rebecca Deemer. Rebecca is here, Senior Director of Academic Programs for us. Thank you, Rebecca. And, and I don't believe I saw, I, I think Dimitri might be joining us, one of our faculty. I see Sean Berman here, professor, former dean of the school. So thank you, Sean. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I really am glad you're here, and I'm excited about this next conversation that we're about to have. So without any further ado, please let me welcome Dr. Rob Del Campo and Peter Sanchez. <laughs> Good evening. <clears throat> Good to see everybody here. Thanks all for coming out and, and working through the, the bartender shortage. I know it's a <laughs> first world problem for you guys. Yeah. Um, I'm excited here to be with Peter Sanchez. Let me, let me uh, read his intro and then we'll get into our conversation this evening. So many know Peter as the leader of the Atrisco companies, uh, but what the most interesting part about him is the um, what you don't know. His background and his journey to this point, which we'll be discussing this evening. His journey began here in Albuquerque, just like many of you. He grew up in the South Valley, attended Navajo Elementary, Polk Middle School, Rio Grande High School, and graduated from UNM with a BBA, and later attended uh, University of Houston Law Center. He's homegrown. By trade, he's both a CPA and an attorney, uh, and spent 20 years of, of his professional career living outside New Mexico in places such as Texas and New York. During this time, he worked in the professional service business and the energy industry. And after these first few professional roles, Peter spent the bulk of his professional career in the technology business. As a technology entrepreneur, Peter worked and helped build four separate technology ventures in the process gaining tremendous experience developing businesses. In 2007, Peter returned to New Mexico to head up the continued legacy of the Atrisco Land Grant, another business startup that today has grown into six companies. He's had a tremendous journey succeeding in education and in his professional life. Philanthropically, Peter has served as the board of director in leadership roles on the Hispano Philanthropic Society of the United Way of Central New Mexico, the National Hispanic Cultural Foundation, the Center Foundation, the UNM Alumni Association, the Golden Apple Foundation, Bosque School, and many others. He's an Albuquerque Business First top CEO, a UNM Alumni Zia Award winner, and is a member of the UNM Anderson School Management Hall of Fame. It's not often that someone with these experiences returns home and enriches our lives with them. Our community 
and absolutely the companies that he works with are the beneficiaries of his return, and we're grateful that he's a leader in our community. So it's my pleasure, and I know you will feel the same once we hear his great story, to welcome the President and CEO of the Atrisco Companies, Peter Sanchez. Thank you. <laughs> so Peter, hopefully that's the most we hear from me tonight. Okay. So you've got plenty to, to talk about. But I will say, I believe the polls just closed in Iowa. Okay. So uh, you know, if you have your phones out. Everybody's going to be reading their phones, right? That's right. Okay. Uh, but we're going to keep them away from that. So Peter, you have a tremendous story, very interesting, very exciting. Uh, we've invited you here tonight for the McKinnon CEO series to do this conversation. And we're trying to fashion our interview here a little bit after the Inside the Actors Studio kind of deal. So we'll yeah. end up with a Proust questionnaire, but we'll start off more about your story. And yeah. it's just really exciting to hear. So let's start off, tell me about how you really ended up at the UNM Anderson School of Management. Well, I, <clears throat> I didn't think of any other place I would end up, to be honest with you. I grew up here and I wanted to go to school here. And I was fortunate to work my way into the business school and, uh, and then graduate from there. So I just met a lot of great people along the way here, here in Albuquerque, people that I did not know. And, uh, and the experience of being in the business school you know, many years back as a matter of fact, it's not there today, the school I used to go into, I noticed. <laughs> it's just gone. Uh, but uh, no, it was just, it was just uh, something that was going to happen. I was meant to go to UNM. Well, you chose accounting. Um, yes. You're a pretty outgoing and affable person, so that's a bit of a surprise to me. <laughs> um, yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. Why did accounting kind of attract you, and, and where did you go with that after you graduated? Okay, that's a good question. Well, um, I think uh, at that time probably you wouldn't have said the same thing. My personality hadn't developed yet, okay. so <laughs> uh, accounting was was I was very practical, and accounting was a way to get a job, and so uh, I went into accounting because I liked numbers and I could get a job. That was important, and so that's what I did. And where did it take me? I actually went to work for initially. I went to Dallas and went to work for Atlantic Ritual, ARCO. And the CEO of ARCO at the time was Robert O. Anderson. So I went to work for the guy who school I was, I was working in, or going to school in, and he gave me a job in Dallas, Texas, and that's how I got there. Okay. So in Dallas, you sort of enter the accounting world in oil and gas, and mm -hmm. uh, you're bopping around there as 22, 23 years old. Yes. Um, so, you know, how do you how do you make the next move? I mean, what do you, you know, what sort of mentors kind of helped you? What kind of shaped your interest in in doing something different? I mean, it's a pretty lucrative career being a, an accountant for an oil and gas company. Yeah, it was sadly in my first job with them. I began to make more money than my parents. Uh, that's not good, but it was what it was. Um, the, it, wasn't a, it was just a great experience to go there and have this kind of job. But how, how did I end up there? I guess, you know, quite honestly, the way I f figured out what I was going to do next in life was sort of just play it by ear. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, when I was at UNM, I, uh, I had, had a professor, and I'll never forget this. She walked in, and she was in a business law class, and she was a JD and a CPA. And I was like, wow. I was impressed, and she was a great professor, um, and that was that was something that stayed on my mind, it, it, the idea that you could combine those two things, and so I still, uh, even though I moved to Dallas and became an accountant, I, I started to pursue those two things in my life. Okay, so you started to pursue that. You were interested in accounting. You said, JD CPA. Again, I'm not seeing the personality part coming out here, but <laughs> we'll get there. Um, and so, so you decided. So you you left Arco and went on to the next stop? Went to, um, I, I worked out a transfer, or they were kind enough to transfer me to Houston, ARCO was, so I worked for a year or two in their chemical division, and then I, I, I left and went to work, I mean, went to, went to law school at University of Houston Law Center. Okay. So I just stayed, walked away from my career. All right, walked away from your career, went full force into law school three years, so what's going on personally in your life at this point, right? You've got your professional life, it's you know, kind of clicking, you're a little bit refocused, moving toward the law degree. Um, 
single guy, big city? How does, how does that kind of work out for you? Well, usually trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I'm not staying busy, I'm getting in trouble. Yeah. So I tried to stay busy. Uh, you know, I achieved my CPA before I went to law school, so I, now law school was a real challenge. And it was hard for me because I was really more of a numbers person than I was a reading and writing person. So I was really going against my weakness uh, when I went to law school. But at the time, uh, MBAs were not as they are today. So I had a BBA. And the difference between a BBA and an MBA in my time was a few term papers, OK? But I know today, watching my wife go through her MBA, that's not the case today. But uh, so to me, getting an, an MBA didn't seem right. It, didn't, it seemed like I was rehashing what I already done. So going, against, going into law school was a way to test myself. Okay. So you really leaned into stuff that wasn't your strength, right? Yeah. And so you kind of grew from that, I'm guessing, right? And kind of came out stronger? Yeah, I, I've had a, and I've noticed this about myself over the years, I have a bad tendency to choose the harder road all the time. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, you know, that was taking the hard road sure. going into law school. Yeah. Um, and uh, I would do it again and again mm -hmm. um, as time went by. Interesting. So after three years of law school, you kind of, you look to the left, look to the right. Those other two people were gone. You graduated, uh -huh. right? Right. And so you've got this fresh JD. You've got the CPA under your belt. And, uh, you know, the possibility of making a lot of enemies with those two things, I'm sure. I was very confused all the time. I'll really? tell you that. Yeah, two very different <laughs> ways of learning. So sure, one of them right. is about getting the right answer, a single answer. Yeah. And as you know, lawyers never give you a single answer, right? They just give you possibilities. So uh, very different ways of thinking. Okay. And I would just always tell people I'm confused. That's just all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you seem to have figured it out. So, so you graduate from University of Houston, and then what's the next step? Where do you go with that sort of career, that combo? of you know, two, you know, a professional certification, a terminal degree, where does that take you? Well, I'm just trying to build myself, you know, I'm trying to build who I am. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I never really thought when I went to law school I was gonna be a lawyer. It wasn't, it was possible that I would practice law, but it really wasn't necessarily gonna happen. I still liked business. Mm -hmm. And so when I came out of law school, I took a job with Deloitte and Touche in New York City, and that, led me to my next path and my next um, work, which was to be a tax consultant in New York. Okay, so how does, uh, how does the kid from uh, Rio Grande High School uh, do in New York, which is you know, different from even Houston, right? That's a totally different lifestyle. New Mexicans and New Yorkers couldn't be more different. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I probably spent the first year being insulted all the time. At least I thought I was being insulted, but they would just be New Yorkers, you know. I just I was very, you know, New, York, New Mexicans are very nice. We don't know how to interpret aggression the way New Yorkers do, and so when somebody was aggressive with me, I didn't understand that for quite a while. I had to culturally adapt to that environment, and and I did. It took a while, but I did. Yeah. So did you find yourself gravitating toward people that are kind of? New Mexican in nature. Did you find those people in New York? There's got to be a couple. Okay. I never found them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I just I learned how to get along with many other different people, you know. And I had a lot of good friends that were Italian and Jewish and Irish, and you know, it was wonderful. Sure. I just learned it was a whole new world to me. That's and um, and after they decided I was okay with in their worlds. We got along fine, you know. Sure. So, well, I mean, it was a pretty brave step to go to Houston, either to Dallas and then to Houston. I mean, you're leaving the state, the box of New Mexico, yeah. right? Yes. Which yes. is difficult to do. And then you go across the country to New York. Right. I mean, how does your family respond to that? I mean, what are your so what's your sort of internal struggle with doing that? How does that work? At this point, my family didn't understand me. Okay. You know, so there <laughs> I tell them I'm going to do this, and they just look at me like, okay. Uh, I remember the first time I told them I was going to quit my job at Arco. They thought I was insane. Because in their world and in their era, when you got a good job like that, you held it for life. And so for me to just go in there one day and announce, uh, by the way, I'm quitting this wonderful job that they've been giving me and it's given me so much, 
They didn't understand that. And now they were just at a point at the, in time when every time I introduced a new idea, they just nodded. Yeah. You know, <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're going to stop ARCO giving you money to go give more money to the university. Yes. And just kind of do this whole thing. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Did they visit often? Did yes. you interact with them a lot? How did that work? Yeah. Out? My family, a lot of times, in a lot of ways, they learned our country through the places that I lived. You know, they visited me often. And New York was a big place for my family to come and visit. They loved coming to New York because it was such a, an interesting place. You know, so yeah, I did have a lot of visits. Yeah, a little bit different than Albuquerque. I a little say. different, yeah, yeah very <laughs> different. Uh, yeah, try being on you know mass trans transit and trains and, and subways and things like that. It's just bizarre, from the way we live here. Sure. Yeah. You know. Sure, sure, sure. Well, let's use this opportunity. Tell me a little bit about about your your parents, about your family. You know, where where do they come from? What did they do? What's their kind of background? And what kind of, you know work ethic did they instill in you? Okay. Well, they were hardworking people. My mother was actually a teacher, um, and she worked for Albuquerque Public Schools. And my father was a butcher. And uh, they were very modest people. We lived very modestly. We had a decent-sized family, so that kept us in check. You know, their, their salaries and earnings were, were in, uh, always stressed. Sure. with all the kids that we had. Um, but they were great parents. I had great parents, and they were very, uh, they taught me a lot of things, mainly hard work, um, how to be fair to people, how to help others. You know, and, they, and then my mother was the real driver for me about education. She, she was a woman in her day that was quite unusual because she, she in the 40s, uh, ended up getting a college degree. And that was kind of unusual for women in that time. So I really leaned into her a lot in my, my upbringing, understanding the, the importance of education. Awesome. Well, that's certainly carried through, and I think we'll, we see it even more as we progress in your career. So back to where you are in your, your life's progression. You're in New York. You're working for Deloitte, um, doing tax. Taxes, yeah. Sounds, sounds super Fun exciting. exciting. Right? Um, and so, I mean, what drag? I mean, it's a huge company. You're working in a major metropolitan area. I'm sure you're making strides within the company, opportunities for promotion. Um, so what strikes your fancy next? Well, I'm still figuring it out. You know, I, I really think my entire 20s was about figuring out, about building myself, trying to figure out what was my niche, what was going to be the thing that really made me excited about my career. I hadn't found it yet, and taxes was not it, by the way. Uh, <laughs> It was interesting. It was very complex and, 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 and challenging to be a tax expert. But I could see that it was just another part to my build. So what happened next was really would lead me to the spaces that I was going to be most happy with. It just so happened that the, one of our clients, um, the CFO of that company, he and I became good friends because we did his taxes. and. Um, he was running a technology company, he and others, and they would ask me to go work for them. So relationships, obviously key and important, and kind of carry through the rest of your kind of career as to how you kind of build on this. So you're doing taxes for this guy, he's a CFO, he says, hey, I like this Peter guy, let's bring him over here, yeah. and, you, and you go to work for him. See, he was Irish, we got oh, along. Oh, see, there you go. Yeah. We got along, we were good. Perfect, interesting. And he, he was a great guy. Um, I went to work at his company, it was called Paraphonics, and they did voice recognition systems. We were trying to take this company public, and, uh, and they asked me to come along for the ride. It was a hell of a ride. Sure. It was a lot of fun. It sounds like it. So it was a startup in New York. Yes. And so you guys are working on voice recognition software, uh, voice recognition product, very early on. This is early this 90s? Is, this is early 90s, yes. Early 90s, so this is not like today. No. Right? This is a very no. early kind of. Very version. rudimentary product at the time. We were more push button, you know, to get the movements within the phone systems that you do today by speaking. Okay, this was early stage voice recognition. So press one to go here, two to go there, that kind of thing. There was some literal voice recognition ability within our products, but they were very um, infantile. You know, yes, no, receptionist. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> Great. Yeah. 
So, so what happened? Did you make it? I mean, did you go public? What, what happened? What was the, what was the ride? I mean, working in a startup is never, is never textbook. No, and, and to be honest with you, the people who were, had built this company had really taken most of the beatings at this point. Right. I came in late stage. I was about a year in front of their IPO. They had been in existence for like 15 years prior to that. So they had done the hard work. I was coming in uh, late stage and um, you know, it was, it, was, it was a perfect experience. We went public, we succeeded, we grew. We used our money to expand our, our markets into Asia, Europe, Latin America. We were a success story. It was really a great experience. That's, that's amazing. I mean, you kind of lucked into it, but through the power of relationships, you were able to kind of work through this. So what was that like? I mean, when you finally get to that IPO, when that company is, you know, you're trying to figure it out and how do we make this happen and how do we pull in enough capital and get enough interest? And you're talking about how it was really a startup and it was really a team focused environment. I right. mean, what did that feel like? How did that work out? Well, you have to understand we're in the 90s and the, the, um, the tech world is just over, it's just been overheating with opportunity. Uh, so this company was really solid. It actually made money and made great revenues and actually made a profit. Uh, which in that day, in the 90s, many tech companies didn't even, they went public without even making a profit. And so this was a very solid organization that I felt really proud to be a part of that, you know, was wonderful in their treatment of me. I got to, what I did for them as I helped them build their international business, I was their international finance director. So I would open offices and create sales forces and work with lawyers, bankers, and accountants to establish a presence in Europe, Asia, and Latin America. Awesome. Get our sales to be global sales. Great. So you go public, there's the IPO, you're creating all these international sales offices. Sounds like, again, a great career to continue, great mm -hmm. opportunity. I'm sure everyone financially did pretty well when everything went public. Yeah, it was perfect. All right. So you stuck around for a few years? Well, the, you know, I, about two years, maybe three years after we went public, I, I, was, I, I was telling somebody earlier, I was like a made man at this point, you know, because we're in the 90s and everybody wants to be public, but not everybody has experience taking companies public. Now I did. So it was easy to get the next job <laughs> because everybody was looking for somebody who knew how to take a company public, and I had been through that. And so the next job would take me back to Houston, another tech company. Back to Houston, so you're coming back across the country. I'm sure mm -hmm. family's probably happy that you're closer to home. Right? Yeah, probably yeah. so. Maybe, probably. <laughs> we didn't really ask them, I guess. So you come back to Houston, and you got another startup that you're yes. working with. Yes. And so what happens this time? So you know, Houston's the energy capital, or uh, one of the big energy markets in our country, and we had I landed in a company that invented. Um, a trading platform, a digital trading platform to trade energy commodities, oil, gas, electricity. Uh, you know, you guys all know today, Charles Schwab and um, Fidelity, you know, we all trade stocks this way, right? But in that time, when in, in the energy markets, people were so archaic in the way they did business, they, they would call up their friends and trade their gas for the month or their oil for the month. And their, their, their world of buyers and sellers was maybe five people. But there were thousands of, of buyers and sellers. And so what we did is we created an energy product, a trading platform to trade energy products that allowed all those thousands of buyers and sellers to anonymously find each other. So price discovery much better, um, liquidity much better, and a digital broker. Um, well, they didn't take us on golf trips like they were doing their other friends, but uh, you know we were anonymous, so they were we were just a, uh, a little bit more um, separated from the way business had been done in the past. Uh, but um, we were a real uh, disruption to that business. So disruptor to the industry, efficiency, growing the market. Mm -hmm. Sounds like the recipe for success. Yeah. All right. So you guys are trying to move toward taking this company public, and so what happens along the way? How does this road twist and turn? Yeah, we were we were sitting in great shape. We actually were even on Fortune cover Fortune magazine. Oh wow! But 
we were about to screw it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to be honest with you, I hope that didn't offend anybody, but um, we made mistakes. We made business decisions and business errors and let our competition catch up to us. And in the end, we failed. Others succeeded here. The, the, the company that did succeed here succeeded mightily, did extremely well. We were first to the market with this idea, but we didn't win the game. And so now I was looking for a job. You know? Interesting. Well, there's a lot of lessons there. Right? Yeah. I mean, there's some basic business lessons, like just because you're first to market doesn't mean you're going to win. Nope. Nope. Right? Also, you know, that Peter Sanchez can screw up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, I've already had a little bit of experience yeah, so with that. Your wife was the first one to laugh at that joke. Too. I just want to point that. Um, and you know, for you, there had to be a ton there. Did how did you feel about that? I mean, when a startup fails like that, you've got people's livelihoods that are tied up in this whole thing. You're looking for a job. You know, you were you know not a, a lower level employee at this no. company. So how did how did that feel for you personally to kind of be like, oh man, this didn't work. Well, it was very disappointing, uh, but quite honestly, when I look up on it now, back, you know, look back on that time, you know, you got to understand the time frame we were in. This is right before the dot-com era, and we were selling to the market a really great idea that had never made any money. And so if people had bought that stock, that could be very dangerous for them. It was very common in that day to buy stock of companies that didn't make money and you weren't sure they were ever going to make money and we were going to be one of those companies so when I look back on it today I kind of think it was better the way it worked out I'm okay with that at the time was it I mean how does that affect your psyche you I mean you've had a professional trajectory that's taken off from Albuquerque and Anderson and just yeah. gone that's a good point yeah. uh, I'm sure it was humbling yeah but I had gotten a lot of humbling in law school so okay. I was <laughs> I, I, I knew it was familiar with that feeling. Okay. <laughs> so, but it was humbling. You know, it was a setback. Whenever you, your company goes out of business and you're out of work, it's disappointing. You know, it's a setback. Well, I know we talked a lot when we had our sort of pre-meeting about how failure is, is so important and necessary yes. and all these sorts of things. Right. So you take this, you put it in your back pocket. You're basically on the job market for really the first time in your career. Correct. And, and I actually want to take a break. Really? Okay. I'm tired. I'm a little tired, mm -hmm. but but it doesn't last very long. Okay. I get a get a call in less than a month. Another group of people that I knew were starting up another company, and they wanted me to join them as their CFO. Mm -hmm. And so that would be my next move. Okay. So another tech company. Another tech company. Okay. So how how does that roll out? So this company was a pure startup, but the other companies had money. They had they had done some good things to build themselves up. And in the second case of Ultra, we, had, we were venture capital backed. So we had money, but this was a pure startup. We had to convince an investor to give us $4 million, which he did, private investor. And we had to build a product that had never been in the market. And we were all operating on a theoretical design. So we were doing market research, um, competitive analysis, just a number of different things to try to build a company doing the coding to build this product that we hoped the market would accept and buy. Sure. How'd it turn out? Badly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Strike two. Yeah. All right. So, so it didn't work out. I'm, 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 I'm not looking good if I'm a baseball right, player. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, you know, we just, we made some judgments about what the market was ready to receive and they weren't ready to receive that. It was, it was different things like we were introducing a product that was going to be sold in a, on a subscription basis. While that's very common today, software was sold on a license basis then. Okay, so that was going to be different. Number two, we were going to ask people, put your data in our servers and we'll, ma we'll manage it for you. We all do that today. But that day, you put your data in a little box below your desk. Remember that? So that was strike number two. And then the third strike, was that um, you know we had uh, a product called open source software that was really kind of in, in its infancy. The real good programmers understood what that was, and we, but the market did not understand what open source software was. And we were trying to take good open source software and 
scrub it up and put it into our product line, and the market wasn't going to buy that either. Okay. So we had three strikes work against us. We spent most of the $4 million, never made a sale, and I was looking for work again. Back on the streets. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. So you're pounding the pavement, looking for work. Yeah. And who, who calls? How does it work from here? So that's, there, there's, there's still time to redeem myself right. and, and my batting average. Because you've got you know, a couple of successes here, but yeah. a couple of not great ones. So. Yeah. So I, the, next, the next one I go to uh, and is, is a company in Houston that had its heyday in, in an earlier time with its products, but now those products have become obsolete and the man and his company, the founder and his company, were living off a maintenance stream from those original products. And he wanted a team of people to turn him around so he could keep his business together. So he hired a VP of sales, a VP of R&D, a VP of tech service, and a CFO. That was me. And so we went about trying to turn this man's company around. And I'm gonna guess that it worked. You turned it around. Success? Yes, this one was a success. All right. So, a uh, little, it wasn't easy. We ran um, into the wall about a dozen times over a three year period trying to find how to get the sales achieved. But um, the product was, was um, database utility products. So, these are the kind of things that IT people buy um, pro tools to help them manage databases. And the bigger players in that market at the time were, were um, Oracle, IBM, Microsoft, and then this little one called Sybase. And Sybase was a billion dollar company, still big in sales, but so much smaller than the other three. And so all of the people that did what we did were paying attention to the top three, and nobody was paying attention to Sybase. And so we, what we did when we finally broke through is we tailored our projects, our tools, to Sybase and Sybase only. And then we convinced Sybase to put our products on their price list. So when they went in to sell their database, they said, hey, and by the way, why don't you buy these really cool um, utility tools to help you manage your database? And the buyers would say, sure, we'll do that. And when we went to do it by ourselves, we were such a small company, they would say, you might be out of business next year. We're not buying your products. So we finally broke through by letting Sybase sell our products and we were able to find the market and turn the company around. Good basic business skills, right? Yeah. Identify a market, right? Fill a gap that other organizations aren't filling. Get someone else to sell your product for you. That's yes. a good one, right? And it okay. kind of works out. So we're getting closer to bringing you back to Albuquerque. You're coming back home now. Yeah. But you've been doing tech companies. You've been doing Deloitte, you know, large scale companies. You're working in tax. And somehow 2007, you end up running the Atrisco companies. How does that, how does that happen? Yeah, um, well, you know, I was trying to figure out my next move because mm -hmm. we, we had achieved something here and it was time to look for other challenges now. But I had, I had my beautiful wife right here, Claudia, and my three kids were young and we wanted to go to a smaller town. I wanted to be back in Albuquerque. Uh, and so I'm looking for the next move and I get a call from a man sitting over here in the second row, Randy Sanchez, who happens to be on the board of Westland Development Corporation, which is the manager of the Atrisco land grant. But this is 2006. They're trying to sell the Atrisco land grant. The real estate market has heated up. The land is very valuable. The city of Albuquerque needs to grow and the only way to go is west. So it's the Atrisco land grant. But we need to sell it and let professional developers develop it. And so, Randy's talking me in to go back to New Mexico, which I love that part of the story of the offer, but he's asking me to take a pay cut and he's also asking me to move into the nonprofit sector. <laughs> and I, I'm in a sexy business, technology. What do I know about nonprofit? I mean, I finally told Randy one day because he called me many, many times. I said, what am I gonna do? I don't know anything about nonprofit. I'm gonna buy some Birkenstocks and grow, put a ponytail on or what? What am I doing here? You know, I don't know this business. And eventually he was persuasive and he got me there. And of course I wanted to go there. And Claudia was happy to go there. So we moved. So you come back, 
you're you're you know you're you're working with the the Atrisco land grant. You know, explain a little bit about the Atrisco land grant, what it is for those who don't understand, and why this sale has worked out when so many other land grants have been, I mean, quite honestly, kind of disastrous in terms of how they turned out for families that have been part of that, et cetera. Yeah. So the Atrisco land grant is land granted to a group of families, a clan of families that settled land here in New Mexico in the west side in the South Valley of Albuquerque. In, uh, they first came in 1598. So we're like the first immigrants to this area. We're the first non-native people. And because we were under Spanish rule, after being here 100 years, the Spanish uh, were kind enough to say, well, we're gonna grant you some land. So they granted us 80,000 acres of land, a lot of land. We were the largest land grant in the Southwest. And we managed to hold that land miraculously for over 400 years. You know, we were, you know, a lot of, a lot of challenging times. <laughs> you can imagine we're, we're frontiersmen back in the 1600s and um, we're, we're, we're not necessarily welcome here. So we got run off one time, back to El Paso, 100 years into it and came back. And then later on in time, you know, challenges were coming from commercial developers trying to take the land, but we held it. We were organized and we managed to hold the land until 2006 when the group now of heirs, which is 8,000 families now at this point, originally it was 12. So we have a lot of cousins, you know, <laughs> uh, and uh, we, we vote and we decide to sell the land, it's time. And you're right, it's an unusual outcome for a land grant. We, we sold it for, I believe it's 325 million. Is that right, Randy? And uh, we paid all our heirs off. They all were, were paid. People made money from this transaction. And then our board, many of them took their stock and retired, but some of them wanted more. There was a younger group of board members, Randy being one of them. And uh, they bargained for assets to try to not end the story there, which would be another unusual thing for our land grant. Because usually that when the end comes, like land is gone, the story is over. You know, so we were gonna we were gonna do something different. And you guys did something tremendously different, which turned into what today are the Atrisco companies. Correct. Six Atrisco Six companies. I mean you guys don't operate like a traditional nonprofit. No, we don't. It is the most unique nonprofit, at least in the state of New Mexico, maybe within the country. I mean, so tell us about all the stuff that, that goes on and how you guys operate the business and what your philosophy is. So we, we, have, we run some businesses you might have heard of, others you may not. I'll just rattle off a few. So we run a company called El Campo Santo. It provides low-cost burial services to families who, who, uh, who are in need. Uh, we run Mariachi Spectacular. Uh, it's been in this community for 30 years. It's an educational business that teaches the music of Mariachi. We run um, the Rio Grande Educational Collaborative, the biggest business we have. It's an academic-based before and after school service that we work in partnership with organizations like Albuquerque Public Schools and others to try to contribute um, productively to the education of children in our state. And, and then another is the most recent one we've added, Fathers Building Futures. It's a 10-year-old nonprofit in this community. It takes formerly incarcerated individuals and brings them through a six-month program to stabilize many factors in their lives and help them reduce barriers that they're up against, but ultimately it helps them present, present themselves to gain a job and hold a job so that they don't return to prison. And uh, that's been a really interesting nonprofit addition to our, our collection of companies. Sure. Well, you know, when you were explaining to me your approach with these companies, you called it the Dion's Pizza model. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, what do you what do you mean by that, and, and what do you kind of subscribe to with what you're offering in terms of these services and what you're offering to our community? So, so the first thing we do is that we don't, in our companies, we don't ask for, we generally don't take grants or donations. We take services and we go and compete in the marketplace with them, but. What we try to do, and this is where the comparison to Dion's is, we try to be the best service at the lowest price. 
I mean, if you ever go to any other city in this country, they're full of Papa John's and Pizza Huts and all kinds of pizza places. But in New Mexico and in Albuquerque, you don't see that. And the reason why is that company, Dion's, is capable of outperforming the market. Better pizza, lower price. So we try to be the Dion's pizza of the nonprofit world. That's great. I love it. I think I will never forget that. <laughs> So as we start to round the corner on our, on our discussion here, um, Peter, and I want to take some questions from the audience if they have some, mm -hmm. uh, but before we get to that, just to give them a little flavor for who you are a little bit sure. deeper, you know, we got we to gotta dive in a little bit. We've gotten some stuff, you know, your wife is making some, some Snickers here and there when you're saying some things, but uh, we mentioned, you know, fashioning this after the Inside the Actor Studio, and what they use at the end of the episodes is what's called the Proust Questionnaire, which I did some... Uh, research on today. Uh, it was actually a parlor game developed by uh, Marcel Proust, the author, and he would do this in his home after dinner when people would retire to the library or whatever uh, because he thought it was fun, first of all, but also believed that it revealed what is the true nature of the individual. Mm -hmm. So some of these questions are a little on the, uh, the blue side, but I mean, you said no questions are off. Uh, off, uh, off the table. So let's just go real quickly through these. So first, what is your favorite word? <laughs> Can. Oh, that was good. Right on brand. I like it. <laughs> All right, so conversely, what is your least favorite word? Can't. Oh. <laughs> I felt that one coming. You can take this a lot of different ways, but what turns you on? Enthusiasm. A safe way out. Ah, <laughs> but I don't, this, this is rated G here. That's right. I have a PG 13, I think, right? What turns you off? Um, indifference. What noise or sound do you love? I remember the wonderful sound of a train on a track in a distance growing up in the South Valley. So I like that sound. It's soothing to me. Okay. What sound or noise do you hate? A utensil in the garbage disposal. <laughs> what is your favorite curse word? My wife knows this one well. Every weekend when I'm watching football, I'm yelling out, you bastards. So probably that. Okay. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I would have loved to have been a sports analyst. So famously, the final question, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Good job. Welcome in. All right. I'll take it. Excellent. Mm. Thank you, Peter. With that, I'd like to open to the audience. If you have any questions, we have a few minutes. If anyone would like to, uh, to ask Peter here anything about his career, life, insights on humanity, whatever you might do. Sports betting tips <laughs> in the back there. Hi, this is Hamam. My question is, how did you manage tech companies without having tech background? Uh, well, I never had to be the inventor, first of all. I was the money guy. You know, I was the one that managed the finance, managed the lawyers, managed the HR. So I didn't have to necessarily be um, a technical person, like a coder might have to, an R&D person might have to. Uh, I simply needed to be capable of managing their business and understanding the tech business. Somebody over there. Well, Mom, that was a great question. Uh, my question is, um, what did you learn from your failures, from your business failures, if there was one? Uh, that it's going to happen. You can't take risk without setback. Um, so, you know, you get over it. It's just part of the, it's part of the journey. Don't feel bad. So I just want to say thank you. Yeah. Uh, I love the fact that your mother worked for Albuquerque Public Schools. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. 
You mentioned you've seen the new Anderson School. Have you seen the new Rio Grande? Uh, I haven't seen the new Rio Grande. I went to Rio Grande Would when you they. Like <laughs> I'd love to see the new Rio. Grande. We we went to the Rio Grande uh, when they were about to take down the gym. We went to that night. Or you need to come see the new gym. Sir. Okay, I'd love to see it. Love to see it. If we could Absolutely. only find somebody who could make that happen. Um, <laughs> any other questions? But we'll have some time after the event. I'm sure Peter will be more than happy to, to, to shake your hand and answer some questions for you. But I have a couple more before we, before we wrap up. So Peter, sure. what I took away when we had our pre-interview, lunch, hanging out, whatever you want to call it, yeah. um, you talked incredibly passionately about your career, which is great. Uh -huh. But you talked even more passionately about your family Correct. and how important it was for you to raise them in Albuquerque. Correct. So I mean, why, why was that so important and why did you feel that that was fulfilled? I mean, you've got three kids. Mm -hmm. They're almost all through high school. You're yes. Almost on three uh, college tuitions here. Right? One, one's done with college. So. Okay, that's good. That's good. You're never done. You're never done. But, uh, so, so tell me about that. I mean, why is that such a source of pride for you? Well, I mean, I'm very proud of my professional career, but I'm always going to be more proud and more concerned about my family. And my family is everything to me. And we have rough times, right? But we pull together and we love each other. And my wife is a great mother. She's a great, she raised three great kids. And I just helped every once in a while drink the coffee. <laughs> You know, so my family's everything. It's great. No, and it definitely comes through, and, yeah. and I'm very happy for you. Well, so to sum things up, this has been great. Um, we're here with a dual purpose to obviously mm -hmm. recognize you and appreciate your service to our community, but also recognize our new inductee to the Hall of Fame, uh, Superintendent Elder. But you're also a Hall of Famer, 2014. Yep. Right. Um, you're a very proud Anderson alum, which we appreciate. But just talk a little bit about what that meant to you, to be recognized and inducted into the Anderson Hall of Fame and how that kind of sits with you and, and moves you forward. Well, I'm very humbled even today by that uh, recognition. I don't know how many graduates of the Anderson School exist. Maybe 25,000? Oh, really? Oh, uh -huh. good guess. I told you I was good with numbers. Account I was good with numbers. Account actuary. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, you know, and, I, and there may be a hundred Hall of Famers, I don't know how many, but um, to just be recognized as one of so many great students that have gone through Anderson School, you know, that's just an amazing uh, feeling for me to be among this community, a community I love and I really um, work hard to, to make a difference in, to be recognized by Anderson as one of the people that you know did something reasonably good, I'm happy about that. Well, I think a little more than reasonably good. We're yeah. we're proud to have you as a as an Anderson alum and proud to have you in the community here. So yeah, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you all for thank your you. questions, everybody. Peter Sanchez. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.